This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59 as we're continuing our study through the Word of God. And last week we concluded with God indicting His people, specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, for their sin. And they were really spiraling out of control, going into spiritual adultery. They were running as far away from God as they could. And yet they were very religious. They were very religious people. They went to temple. They offered sacrifices. They fasted. And yet they were living a life of sin, of immorality, and they couldn't understand why God wasn't hearing them, why God wasn't acknowledging them, why God wasn't responding to them. It, it was really a life of hypocrisy, and God wasn't going to accept that, and God never accepts that. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I could never understand this idea of Fat Tuesday, you know, which is the day before Lent starts on Ash Wednesday. The idea of Fat Tuesday basically is that you party hardy, you sin all you want, you live like the devil before Lent begins, and then once Lent begins, you fast and you do what's right. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It makes no sense, and God doesn't accept that. But let's face it, people go to church, they may even be involved in church, and they are living like the devil, thinking that they're okay before God because they go to church or they, you know, are involved in a church ministry or something, and they're not. I'm not saying that to be saved you have to keep the commandments of God, the law of God, not at all. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But make no mistake about it, we're not, you know, if we say that we love the Lord and we're not obeying His commandments, something's wrong. That was Jesus' whole point. In Matthew chapter 7, when he said, you know, or 6, excuse me, when he said, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? There's the problem. You say that you love me, but you're not obeying me. God wants us to be obedient to him. He wants us to obey what he said. Otherwise, it's empty faith. It's not real. James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. That's so important for us to understand. You know, we not only have to hear God's word, but then we have to apply it to our lives. We have to live it. Not that we're perfect. We'll never be perfect in this life. But that should be the passion of our heart. Now, keep in mind, it was, a, it was common in the ancient world for people to hear a teacher. But if you follow the teacher and try to live what he said, you were called a disciple of that teacher. You know, Jesus was looking for disciples, doers, not just hearers. Spurgeon put it like this, he said, I fear we have many such in all congregations, admiring hearers, affectionate hearers, attached hearers, but all the while unblessed hearers because they are not doers of the word. That really was the southern kingdom of Judah. They may have heard the word of God, but it wasn't applied to their lives. They went to temple, but they never let God's word into their lives. They were worshiping idols. They sacrificed their children to the god Molech in the fire and so on. It was hypocrisy. Well, as we move into chapter 59 of Isaiah this evening, we're going to see the Lord speak to his people. And what is spoken by the Lord is really born out of what his people said in Isaiah 58, 3. They said, why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you don't take notice? In other words, God, look at all that we're doing for you and you're not doing anything for us. They're blaming God for what was happening in their lives instead of taking a good look at their own lives. And because of what they accuse God of doing, not listening to them, not working in their lives, not paying attention to them, the Lord is going to answer their question. He's going to show them who's at fault, and, you know, it's not God. So with that as our background, we're going to pick up in Isaiah chapter 59, starting in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Again, remember what the people were complaining about. They were wondering if God could respond to the situations that they faced in life. If he was powerful enough to help them, they were wondering if God could hear their cry. If he understood their problems that they faced, or maybe he's not even interested in the things that they were going through. But to answer those questions, Isaiah says that, you know what, guys? God's not the problem. God can respond to our problems. His strength is not diminished. He can hear their hearts cry. He understood their problems that they faced. And he was interested in what they were going through. And here's the thing, and it's just pretty obvious. If God's not the problem, who is? Well, we don't even have to guess on this one. It's pretty obvious. Look at verse 2 of Isaiah 59. 
but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's very clear, Isaiah says. It's not a lack of power or interest on God's part. But the sin, your sin has separated you from God. Now, what does that mean that our sin has separated us from God? Well, it, it, you know, it can't mean that God doesn't know what sinners are doing. God knows everything. It can't mean that it separates us from the presence of God because his presence fills the universe. Even Satan still has access to God. He has an audience with God, according to Job 1.6. Sin does not even separate us from the love of God because God loves sinners. Well, then what does sin separate us from? Really, the bottom line is fellowship, that intimate fellowship with God. And the reason is simple. We don't think like God thinks. Our desires are not his desires apart from him. Sin separates us from the blessings of God. You know, God doesn't have to bless us. He doesn't have to answer our heart's cry because we're not his children, but sometimes he does. And sin separates us in some way from the protection of God. And God allows things in our life to bring us to the point where we look up to him. He'll use those things in our life. And I think as you look at that, as you look at that, that sin separates us from the fellowship of God, you can understand the cry of Jesus from the cross of Calvary when he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus stood in our place. He became sin for us. He bore the sins of the world. And it wasn't that Jesus became a sinner, but he took our place to pay in full the penalty for our sins. And he took the wrath that was due us. And as he did, the Father turned his face from the Son. That fellowship was broken. That's what sin does. And remember, as we studied the, the Gospel of Matthew, that at 12 noon, Jesus cried this out, and darkness covered the land. And from 12 noon to 3 in the afternoon, until he gave up his spirit, darkness fell. That fellowship was broken. Something that they never experienced in eternity past and will never experience again. When Jesus sacrificed his life for us and broke that fellowship with the Father for those hours he hung on that cross, those three hours from 12 noon to 3. Now, some may say, well, what can be done now? If sin has separated us from God, how can we get him to turn his face back towards us? I mean, we go to temple. We can't be that bad, can we? I mean, really, think about it. We're, we're pretty good people. God, in a sense, birthed us as a nation. So he's got to love us, right? We, we're not that bad. Well, look at starting in verse 3. This is what God has to say. It says, For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes the, that way shall not know peace. Now, they saw themselves righteous before God, and that the problem wasn't really with them. The problem was with God. And God's saying, hey, man, no. Look at the, it's your sinful life. That's the problem. You proved violence, murder. And everything you put your hands to, you're doing evil towards people. And they justified their actions, just like many do today. And it wasn't only physical violence that we see, but the words they spoke were lies. And those lies destroyed people's lives. Things that flowed from their lips were evil. They were perverse. And they're not calling for justice because they like the lifestyle that they're living in. They're not just interested in the truth because they're comfortable in the lies that they believe. And sadly enough, they're trusting in these empty words to save them, to help them, to deliver them. And in the end, it's going to destroy them. You know, it's amazing 
how we look at life today and, and how complex it is. And one of the questions between the debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, one of the questions was, you know, because Bill Nye believes in the Big Bang, I believe it's coming, it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> but one of the questions was, where did all the material come from? I don't know. See, everything has to have a beginning. It just can't appear. Who put it all there? And that's a question that they can't answer apart from God. It just doesn't appear in the heavens. It doesn't just, in their idea, is condensed to this tiny dot and then explode. And look at the complexity of life today. But they're very comfortable in believing what they believe. Why? Because they're not accountable to anyone. We're just happenstance. It doesn't, it, we're just pure chance, pure luck that we're all here. There was a creator who created us. Look in the depths of the ocean where there's very little light that gets to and the colorful fish. Evolution says they should be gray. There shouldn't be any color to them at all because there's no need for color down there. Why do you have color there? Because there's a creator God who <coughs> loves variety. Just look at every single person in this room. <laughs> look at the variety of people we have. Look at the comp complexity of the human body itself. Everything works together. The eye, unless it's fully formed, is useless. Yet it not only has to be fully formed, but it has to connect to the brain, and the brain has to understand what's going on. My brother said it took five million years for one eye to form. So what is it, 10 million years for two eyes? What about the brain? I, I don't get it. And where do you come up with five million? I mean, just a dartboard? Even... Um, oh, slipped, slipped my mind. Uh, who's the guy that did evolution? Uh, Darwin, thank you. I don't know why it slipped my mind, but it did. <laughs> he believed that once we understand the, the human eye more fully, the whole theory of evolution falls by the wayside, and it does. I mean, even look at the lungs, the blood vessels, everything. It's all interconnected. Why do we have kidneys if we don't have a bladder? I mean, how did it all f just happen to form? And think about it. From amoeba to a woman who gives birth, and giving, you know, having pregnancy for nine months and having a child grow within you is not just a random chance happening. That is very complex. It doesn't just happen. But you see, we don't like to look at the evidence because then we're accountable. And that's what's going on here. They were happy with what they were believing in, whatever it was. They had all these false gods that they were worshiping, even sacrificing their children to the god Molech in the fire. They'd have their little tiny infants and place them in the brazen arms, red hot, fired up, and murder their children. They'd be banging drums to... so they couldn't hear the cries of these children. And, this is, and they're like, why are you mad at us, God? We didn't do anything wrong. That says there's blood on your hands. Your lives have destroyed many. And they didn't have a fear of God. And so they just did as they pleased. They were running after evil. And God's saying, look, your works are not going to last. You're not going to prosper. There's a path of destruction wherever you go. And how true that is. And if God was indicting Israel back then for their evil ways, then why do we think we can do all kinds of evil? And God's going to say, well, that's just fine. Go ahead and do it. He's not. And here's the thing. God says, look, you're not going to find the way of peace because you're traveling down the wrong road. You're going down the crooked paths, and those paths lead to destruction. Jesus says you've got to enter by the narrow gate, the straight gate. Apart from me, you're not going to find peace in your lives. The broad way, the wide gate, is the path of destruction. In fact, Isaiah 57 talks about no peace for those that have rejected God. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my, Lord, says my God, for the wicked, because it's only found in Christ. And once you make peace with God, then you can experience the peace of God in your life. And that's what the scriptures tell us. 
Otherwise, our lives end up being tossed back and forth, churning and kick, kicking up all kinds of dirt. And there's no rust, there's no peace. And you look at America and you look at all the things that we have, and we should be the most happy, joyous nation in the world. We're like the most depressed nation in the world. Why? Because we're looking for peace and rest in all the wrong places. We're looking for that in things, and things never satisfy. There's always something bigger or better or brighter, newer, whatever. You know, I just got the iPhone 4. What do you mean? We're up to the iPhone 6 or whatever. I don't know. It's amazing how technology changes, and we put everything in that basket looking for peace and joy, and we don't find it because it's found in the Lord. Look at verse 9 of Isaiah 59. Therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness, for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none, for salvation, but it is far from us. Again, I think Isaiah is speaking here for the Lord, and he's really speaking for the people. He's representing them. And he's saying, look, you guys are walking in darkness. That's what Paul said in uh, the New Testament, that apart, before we were saved, we were walking aimlessly through life. He said that we once walked according to the course of this world in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath just as others. Now here's the thing, you don't have to walk in darkness. You can walk in the light, but you have to repent of your sins. You have to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. If you refuse, what Isaiah is saying is you're just going to grope around and try to find a wall to guide you. It could be high noon, but it's still going to be dark. You're going to be stumbling. Our hope is in Christ. And obviously, sin is fun for a time. But then the reality comes in. And Isaiah says, you know, you're looking for justice. And you're not finding any. And the only salvation you're going to find is in God. You need to turn to him. Well, verse 12 says, For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, in departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Now, did they come to their senses? Did they realize that it was their sins? I think they get it, and then they don't get it. And they get it, and they don't get it. They kind of go back and forth. But at least they're not blaming God here. They saw the error of their ways. Now, here's the thing. God has placed in our hearts what's right and what's wrong. But we can short-circuit that system and ignore what God has said. It doesn't change the fact that you're guilty before him if he transgresses his commands. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.2 that having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The word seared in the Greek speaks of a cauterizing effect. There's no feeling. It'd be like, you know, getting a hot iron and placing your hand on it several times, you know, and you kill all the nerve endings so you don't have any pain anymore. And ignoring sin is exactly what, it is what that's like. Beyond feeling. No more awareness of what's right or wrong. I mean, how do people murder their children? I mean, I, I don't even, for the life of me, I don't get that. Is our hearts that hardened that they, they've lost the, that natural affection towards their own children? Their past feeling? They're walking in darkness. That's the problem. 
And Isaiah is saying, man, you guys are so far away from God that there's no justice. You've moved away from righteousness. Truth was not seen any longer. And you just treat people totally unfair. And I've said this so many times before, but if your relationship with God is off, then your relationship with your fellow man will be off. You get the vertical axis right and your horizontal axis with your fellow man will be in line. But what happens is if this is not in line, when someone rubs us the wrong way, we lash out at them. And I know exactly what this is like because before I was saved, I mean, I was a pretty nice guy. I, my temper was pretty good. But boy, you pushed me just over that edge. And I may be tiny, but man, you just act like you're a madman and people are terrified of you. That was me. I, when I you know, drove in my car, my wife would be hiding under the dashboard because she was so terrified. Someone would cut me off. I would, sorry, Mickey, I would be on their bumper, man, I, because this is my road, and they have no right to do that to me. How dare they? I allow them to drive on my road, but to cut me off? And that was me. Now it's just like, eh, not a big deal anymore. I don't care. I don't, I don't know the last time I honked my horn. My wife loves to honk her horn, but I, hey, maybe you didn't see me, maybe you don't care, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. But we're seeing our society use, lose that natural affection towards each other. The love of many has grown cold. It's all about us. And that's the problem. And when some of the people in the southern kingdom of Judah were standing up for God, they were standing up for righteousness, they became targets for the wicked. And we even see that happening today. When someone stands up for God, stands up for what's right, when they're standing up for morality, they're ridiculed, put down. You know, the media tries to do a character assassination on the person. You know what? God will take care of your character. You live like you're supposed to. And I realize that's hard for all oh, the media would never do that. My brother-in-law, this is years ago, was um, going to be working in a, uh, for video when they had, let's see, this was probably about, I don't know, 25 years ago. He was at school trying to get into television, and he was going to do work with the cameras. And he was working alongside this, this news reporter, and they were ed editing some film footage. And he said, watch this. And my brother-in-law is watching it, and he goes, they had this, it was a, an abortion uh, pro-life rally, and they interviewing someone who was for abortion. And he, it was the most articulate person you can imagine. I mean, their speech was so good. And then he said, okay, now watch this. And he picked the Christian, who was the most bizarre person you could ever imagine. I mean, they were just out there somewhere. Who knows where they, what planet they were from. Why would they do that? Because they're standing up for the unborn. They're standing up for righteousness. And the world doesn't like it. How sad. Well, look at the last half of verse 15 in Isaiah 59. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him. There was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. Now, remember we talked about the people thinking God doesn't hear and God's unaware of what's going on in their lives. And we see right here that God is very aware of what was going on in their lives and in our lives. And as he looked at what was happening in the lives of the southern people of the southern kingdom of Judah, it displeased him. He saw the evil that they were involved in. And you would think that was bad enough that someone would see the evil they were in and not do anything about it. And no one in the nation was standing up. They were silent. And I think for many Christians today, we need to stand up. You know, I was so thankful when um, people stood up when, um, oh, yeah, I should write these things down, huh? <laughs> World Vision, thank you, thank you. 
World Vision said that we're going to allow uh, gay couples to work at our organization. I'm so thankful that Christians rose up and they had a change of heart the next day. Why? Why did they have a change of heart? Financial reasons. It wasn't that they changed what they believed. That's sad. But we need to stand up for when things are wrong, even within Christian organizations, we need to stand against it and not let it slide. Here, Isaiah is standing up in the southern kingdom of Judah, proclaiming, you guys are in sin, you're in trouble. You're going to be going into captivity. Jeremiah, the next book we're going to be getting into, is going to do the same thing. For 40 years, he spoke to a nation. They threw him in a pit. They refused to, to listen to him. 40 years, not one person got saved. That's disheartening, okay? But he fulfilled the work that he was supposed to do. Warning the people, look, judgment's coming. You need to turn. And then it got to the point, well, there's no point in turning. Just go to Babylon and, you know, support the king of Babylon. You're going to come home, but you got some captivity because of your sin. We need to stand up against the evil and stand up for righteousness. Now, look at the last part of verse 16 and on into verse 19. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness had sustained him. For he put on right righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with the zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now, when you look at all that the Lord is saying here through the prophet Isaiah, it's a pretty sad picture. God's waiting for his people to turn back to him. And they refused, for the most part. And he waited for someone to rise up and be that intercessor and plead for the people of God and lead them back into righteousness. But for the most part, there was none. And God stepped forward now and he intercedes for them. In fact, prior to the final assault on the southern kingdom of Judah, in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 29 through 31, it says, The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. In other words, God's saying, look, I'm looking for someone who's going to stand in the gap for this nation. And there wasn't anyone. He poured out his judgment on the people. Now, why does God sometimes choose to act and save in one instance and not in another? He's sovereign. I don't always understand the hows and whys of God. I just know that he's a righteous and holy God, and he's going to do what's fair and right. But I think, you know, as Christians, there are many Christians that just complain about where America's at. Are we interceding? Are we praying for our leaders? Are we praying for this nation? That's what we need to be doing. That's what the Lord was looking for, for a man that would make a wall and stand in the gap for him. On behalf of the land, on behalf of this nation. Can God do the same as he did with Israel? Yeah, he can save this land. He can save this nation. But I think we need to stand up. And I realize that, you know, some have a picture of God as this benevolent old man, and, you know, it's just love, 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 love is all you need, right? Sorry. And our God, make no mistake about it, he is a God of love. I mean, you just have to look at the cross, and he is, there's tremendous love. But here's the thing that people negate. He's a holy and righteous God, and he has to deal with sin. He can't ignore it, because then he wouldn't be just. He wouldn't be holy. And that's the problem. If, God forbid, someone murdered your family member and they caught the guy, and you go to court. I mean, it's a 
open and shut case. I mean, it's so, uh, he, everything points to this guy, he is guilty. And the judge even knows he's guilty. He says, you know what? You lived a pretty good life. I mean, you've only killed one person. And for the most part, you've done really good in your life. I mean, I, you've worked with the Boy Scouts, you helped out over here, you did this. You know, I'm just going to let you go. How would you feel? Would that be a righteous judge? No. Then why do we think a holy God can just ignore sin? He can't. You see, I think the reason we, we want God to ignore our sin is because we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to deal with our sin. But we need to understand who God is. That he's a holy and righteous God and he will deal with sin. And he has dealt with sin. We're going to talk about that in a minute here. Now, as we get into verses 20 and 21, because that's going to be talking about the Redeemer, it really fits in better with chapter 60. You think, well, why is that? Because the verses and chapter divisions were put in at a much later date. They are not inspired. They were put there for uh, our convenience. It's definitely much easier for me to tell you, turn to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, than for you to go through the book of Isaiah to find out where we're looking at with no chapter divisions or verses. So they don't always flow that easily. And so chapter or verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah 59 really fit in with Isaiah chapter 60. But let's read verses 20 and 21. The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Who's going to come to Zion? The Redeemer. In the Hebrew, it's the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, is coming to Zion. And that, that's very interesting to me. You know, you can look in our study in Ruth because the whole book of Ruth is a beautiful story of the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer's name in the book of Ruth is Boaz. But just to kind of set the stage real quickly and to go through this, Elimelech and Naomi moved to Moab because there was a famine in the land and there in Moab, Elimelech died. And Naomi had two sons, and they both married Moabite women. Then the two sons died, and they left their wives, Orpah and Ruth. And over the course of time, Naomi returned to Bethlehem. Orpah stayed in Moab. Ruth wanted to go with Naomi. She wanted to be with Naomi and the God that she served. And upon returning to Bethlehem through a series of God-ordained circumstances, Ruth has this encounter with Boaz, a relative of Elimelech, and because he was a near kinsman redeemer, he could purchase back the land for his relative. He could bring forth a child for the dead husband to carry on the name for this family by marrying Ruth. And that's exactly what takes place. And this is a, during a period when a very dark, dark period for the history of Israel. It's during the book of Judges. And you can read, I mean, we're reading through the Bible, going through the book of Judges, and it's a horrible, dark period of time for them. But here's a story of redemption right in the middle of this dark period. The Bible story of redemption begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and it continues on through Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. That's the primary focus. God redeeming sinful man. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he is our, our goel, our kinsman redeemer. He, to do this, to be a kinsman redeemer, he had to be a near relative of the one who had lost the inheritance. In other words, God became flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, in John it talks about God became flesh and tabernacled among us. God indwelt the body of flesh. So he was the one who could come and redeem us. He had to be willing to be a redeemer. You can reject it. You didn't have to fulfill that role. But Jesus did. He laid down his life freely. And he has to be able to pay the price of redemption. He was the perfect sacrifice. Peter says he is without spot or blemish. 
He had no sin in his life. If he did, he could never be that perfect sacrifice for us. So Jesus met the requirements. And, you know, Isaiah 59, verse 20 could be reworded, I will send my Messiah, the Redeemer for all humanity, Jesus of Nazareth. Because that's exactly what took place. And this Redeemer is coming to Zion. That's the promise that God made to the Jewish people, that the Messiah, the Redeemer, will sit on the throne of David. Did it happen during his first coming? Absolutely not. In fact, he was rejected by the people. But he's coming again. And he will set up his kingdom. And he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. I mean, you look at the things that are happening in Israel today, it pretty much blows you away. I mean, you can go to, um, uh, what is it, the Temple Foundation uh, in, in Israel. You can go to their website. You can see all the implements for the temple that they want to rebuild. Imagine that. They want to rebuild the temple. There's no temple there right now. In fact, the, when you look at all the pictures of the Temple Mount, you see that big gold dome there. That's the Dome of the Rock. That's the Muslim site. How are they going to do that? How are they going to build this temple on the Temple Mount when the Muslims won't even go, let them go up there to pray as Christians, we can't even go up there and worship God, sing praise songs, or even bring a Bible on there. They won't let us. So how are they going to be able to build a temple? In fact, every time they want to bring a foundation stone up to the Temple Mount, there's a big riot that breaks out. Because John tells us in Revelation, to, to, he tells John, measure the temple proper, but leave out the outer court because that's been given to the Gentiles. And if you look at the temple proper and where it was located, it wasn't where the Dome of the Rock is. It's where the Dome of the Spirits is. And thus, if that's the Holy of Holies where the Dome of the Spirits is, it puts the Dome of the Rock in the outer court. And John says, don't measure that. It's been given over to the Gentiles. Exactly. So during the tribulation period, you can have the temple rebuilt and the Dome of the Rock standing right next to it, which is hard to even imagine today. But the Antichrist makes a peace deal with Israel, and this is one of the things he allows them to do, to rebuild the temple, which they can get up and running very quickly. Everything is in order. The priests have gone to school to learn how to do all the sacrifices. They can get it up and running in no time, and they're ready to do it. So it's going to happen. Well, look at chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, Shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep dark, darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. You know, it was dark. They couldn't find their way around. Remember, we talked about that already. And now, the darkness is expelled by the light that's come. Jesus Christ is going to pierce that darkness. And it's not only for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. The Gentiles shall come to your light. Wow. And make no mistake about it, God's not done with the Jewish people, as some like to say. And tragically, some Christians like to say. All Israel will be saved. The nation will be saved as a whole. They will come to Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But... They will be going through the tribulation period, those seven years. And it's during that time that we see the Jews call upon Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When he pierces that darkness, you can read Matthew 24. As lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know how it is when lightning flashes at, when it's dark outside, man? It lights up the sky. When he comes, every eye will see him. <coughs> every eye. <clears throat> now, think about how our sins are taken away. Some people feel that for the Jews, their sins are taken away differently than Gentiles. Well, that's ridiculous. It's only by the shed blood of Christ. In fact, even in the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. 
In the New Testament, we see the same thing. When Jesus Christ was crucified on Passover, when he hung on the cross, remember the Roman soldiers were going to come and break the legs of those that were being crucified? And they broke the legs of those that were on either side of Jesus? Why, why did they break their legs? To hasten their death. Because if their legs are broken, as they're hanging on the cross, they can't push up to exhale. And so they'll just suffocate. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. And as the Bible says, not a bone, bone was to be broken of the Passover lamb. Just like the Bible says. I'm so excited about uh, one of the representatives from Jews for Jesus coming out and sharing the Passover meal with us and how it speaks of Jesus Christ. Jesus, or the Bible says that the scroll of the book is written of him. Wow. In fact, even after, after Jesus' death and resurrection, when he met with his men after he rose from the grave, he did a Bible study from the Law and the Prophets, from the Psalms, from Genesis through Malachi. He gave him a Bible study showing how it, was a, it all portrayed him. Wow. That must have been some Bible study. Well, look at verse 4. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah and those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaoth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roosts? Surely the coastland shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first. To bring your sons from afar their silver and their gold with them to the name of the Lord your God and to be whole and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in pro procession. For the nation and kingdom which will not serve you, shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, and the box tree together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. You know, when the Lord returns, he's going to regather the Jewish people from all over the world. Matthew 24, 31 talks about that. He's going to gather his elect from the four winds uh, from one end of heaven to the other. And think about where it, the Jews are at today. They're back home again. Almost 2,000 years without a homeland. That's incredible. You know, when people are uh, without a homeland, when they are removed from the, their land, they tend to get assimilated with other cultures, not the Jews. In fact, the Hebrew language was a dead language. In around, I think it was about 250 B.C., they translated the uh, Hebrew scriptures into Greek because most of the Jews had a hard time reading Hebrew anymore. But the Bible says that they're going to go back to the Hebrew language. You know what they speak in, Hebrew, in Israel today? Hebrew. Go figure that one. And they're back in the land, just as God said. In Ezekiel 37, God said to Ezekiel, and he saw this valley of dead bones, and he said, Ezekiel, can these bones live? He's like, I don't know, you know. And all of a sudden, these bones started coming together. And it was a picture of God bringing the, the Jews back into the land, raising them up really from the dead almost, because Hitler slaughtered 6 million Jews. And in, on May 15, 1948, Israel became a nation again. That's incredible. Only God can do that. In fact, the world was against the Jews. And Hitler almost destroyed them. But there's coming a time in the kingdom age when 
the Jews will no longer be put down. They, the times of the Gentiles will be done. And the Jews will be looked, for, looked in favor upon. People are going to bring them gifts. No longer are the gates of the city going to be closed. They're going to be open. The city gates were there for protection. Don't need it in the kingdom age. Because righteousness will fill the land. Now, in verse 6 here of Isaiah 60, we see golden incense mentioned. What's interesting is myrrh's not mentioned. When Jesus was born, maybe a little under two years of age after his birth, after his birth, because the wise men didn't come to Jesus when he was in the manger. <laughs> Jesus was a little bit older, um, and I don't want to get too much into that, but they come to worship him, and they bring to Jesus gold, incense, and myrrh. Why? Because in his first coming, the myrrh represented his death, his suffering. Myrrh was used as a burial spice, and he's risen. He's finished the work that the Father sent him to do. And so now when he comes again, there's no more myrrh. You see the gold that speaks of royalty, majesty, incense which speaks of his position as priest, and the worship of him. But no myrrh, because the work is finished. Our sins have been paid in full by Jesus. Well, look at verse 14 of Isaiah 60. And the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you, and all those who despise you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet. And they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, so that no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. You shall drink the milk of the Gentiles and milk the breast of, the ki of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze, and instead of stones, iron. I will, make, I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. You know, anti-Semitism is on the rise throughout this world. It's hard to even imagine after what Hitler did and, and the atrocities, but it is on the rise throughout the world. In some parts of, of Europe, the Jews are told not to wear anything that makes people think of them as being Jewish because there's such hatred towards them. Really? In this day and age, in the 21st century, we hate people that much? Yeah. And that's what the Bible says. It's going to grow so bad that the entire world is going to come against the Jews. And we see it today. I mean, the Jews are trying to protect a piece of property that's just the size of New Jersey from 100 million, over 100 million enemies that want them destroyed, wiped off this planet. There's bombs being launched almost every day into Israel. Can you imagine if that happened in the United States, say Mexico did that to us? Man, they would be toast, wouldn't they? One, one missile launched into the United States from Mexico, and we would toast them. But when it's happening in Israel, what do we say? Oh, just give them land and make peace with them. How has that worked? They just got a closer area now to launch their missiles from. There's one report from Ayatollah Ali Khamenei that's it's acceptable to kill all Jews and annihilate Israel. And he said that, it, that uh, it's perfectly okay for Iran's Islamic government to not only destroy them, but then to take the land from them. Interesting. You know, you can look at maps from other countries that surround Israel, and you will not find the state of Israel on those maps you will find the state of Palestine. Jews can't travel to these other countries, but they can travel there to Israel. They have no problem. In fact, from Syria, there was a little girl brought 
to Israel because of war injuries that she had acquired in that catastrophe that's going on over there. And the Israelis had no problem taking care of her and treating her. But do you really hear that stuff on the news? Israel's the bad guy. That's the problem. And, you know, I don't know if you, any of you have saw when um, Benjamin Netanyahu was in the United States and the speech he gave. But he basically said to America, wake up. You think the IC or the ICBMs that uh, Iran is making is for Israel? They don't need those for Israel. These are long-range missiles for Europe and the United States. And you better wake up, because they're not for us. They're for you. And they're not <laughs> going to put, he said, you know, hundreds of kilos of TNT. It's a nuclear payload that you put in those missiles. So it's time to wake up and not, you know, be so foolish. We've, we, we are blinded to what's going on around us. And it's very sad. But I'll tell you, the hatred towards the Jew Jewish people will continue to grow and grow. And it, it irritates me more than anything to see Christian churches and organizations that come against the Jewish people. They're not perfect. That's not what I'm saying. But these organizations are pro-Palestine, which is the most ridiculous thing because there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Well, I guess there is. The Palestinian Post was a Jewish newspaper. The Palestinian Brigade was a, uh, uh, Jewish army soldiers. The Palestinian Symphony was the Jewish orchestra. The land was called Palestine. It was a name, a derogatory name, given to them by the Romans in 120-something A.D. when they were finally kicked out of the land. And what the Romans were saying is, you're never going to have this land again. We we're calling it Philistia. And then it became Palestine. It is Israel. And when the Jews came in on May 15, 1948, and declared that it's also a nation, they didn't declare this the state of Palestine. They declared it the state of Israel. And go back and do some research and find out that the so-called Palestinians of today their leaders never wanted to be called Palestinians. They hated that name. Well, why do they use it? Because they need something for propaganda. But it's going to get worse. Now, why is the Lord raising up the Jewish people again? Why is he going to be dealing with them? Are they such a great people? Are they so, have they achieved so much that God just has to use them? No. The Lord made a promise to the Jewish people, and what he has promised them, he will fulfill. It's not because they're such a great people. It's just like us. We're not such a great people. God didn't say, you know, Pastor Joe is such a nice, adorable guy. I just got to save that guy. No. I'm a stiff-necked, rebellious person just like you. And God loves sinners, and he died for sinners. He didn't die for righteous people. Why would you go to a doctor if you're healthy? You wouldn't. You go to a doctor because you're sick. I need a Savior, so I go to Jesus. That's the bottom line. And, you know, we could see what happens in the lives of the Jewish people and for the Gentiles in verse 16. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior <coughs> and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. We know what he's doing. We know who's doing it. Well, look at verse 19. The sun shall no longer uh, be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. Also your people shall be, all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Now, is this speaking of the kingdom age or the eternal state where God creates a new heavens and a new earth? I tend to look at this as being the uh, uh, eternal state. Revelation 21, 23 says, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated the Lamb 
is its light. So in the eternal state, there's no need for the sun or moon because the Lord's going to be the light in the new heavens and the new earth. And so I, I tend to see this as more as the eternal state, not the kingdom age, which is the thousand year reign of Christ. But after that, when God creates a new heavens and a new earth, and every tear is going to be removed from the eyes, there's no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more sin. The former things have passed away. And boy, long for that day. Now, when you look at this world, you don't see a whole lot of righteousness today. But, you know, I think the hard part for us is that we get discouraged when we see these things happening. The wonderful thing is God is very patient. He's very long-suffering because his desire is that none would perish, but come, all would come to the faith. But God will deal with the unrighteous. He's going to deal with those that refuse to come to him. You know, it's, it's not, Isaiah said our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's, it's, you can't even compare it to the righteousness of God. And the only righteousness that God accepts is perfection. Sin is, the Greek word is hamartia, I believe it is. And it's, it was, became known as an archery term. And the archery term was the bullseye hitting the mark, dead center. And God says, your sins have separated you from God. No longer are you hitting that mark, but you missed it. What if you miss it by just a fraction of an inch? I mean, you're so close, you still missed it. You could miss it by a million miles, or you can miss it by a fraction of an inch, and you still miss the mark. And that's why Jesus came, to save us from our sins, something we couldn't do on our own. And as we get in next, next time, in Isaiah 61, we're going to be talking about the good news of salvation. Because what Isaiah is speaking of here is what the Lord said when he began his earthly ministry. And it talks about his first coming and it talks about his second coming in that same section. So we'll deal with that next time. But, you know, we need to have, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. As the days get darker out there, and they are. I mean, you, you look at the wickedness and you think, man, can it get any worse? And I said that, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and I look at it today, I'm like, wow, I guess it could. But you keep your eyes on Jesus. And like John said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And that's our prayer. But until that time, hey, man, let's stand up for righteousness. Let's shine in this dark world. Let's speak for the good news. Of Jesus Christ. And Sunday morning in the book of Acts, that's what we're dealing about. The book of Acts is moving the gospel message forward. It's presenting it to a lost and dying world. And that's what they did. And many were put to death for their faith. And today, in the 21st century, people are still being put to death for their faith. And you're a Muslim and you come to Christ, you could be put to death, and many have. In India, many have. So, in the days we're living in, it's going to get worse. But if God is for us, who could be against us? And I'm so thankful that I know where I'm going. And I think that's why Paul said, none of these things move me. I know the course that God has set for my life. So, if whatever man tries to do to me, it doesn't matter. Because God's in control. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. End of story. So none of these things are going to move me. I'm going to go forward with the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you for your word this evening, Lord. And man, even in these darkest days, or some of the darkest days in Israel's history, before they were sent away into captivity, you spoke about the light that was coming, the Savior, the Redeemer, and we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, he's come. Jesus has come as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He's coming again as the Lion from the tribe of Judah. And he's going to deal with the Christ-rejecting world, and he's going to deal with the Jewish people once again. But Lord, even during the tribulation period, many come to know. And we thank you for that. But help us to stand up for Jesus right now and just proclaim the truth, the gospel message, the good news. 
We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.